This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 829, recorded on November 12th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. And I have to say that our weather is slightly noteworthy um, because we were supposed to have terrible rain all day. And we've got some beautiful sun out there right now. Uh, when I got here about an hour ago, it was raining. So... We had quite a storm go through Manhattan. I was up at Columbia today. We were about to leave our building to go to the mouse house, and it started <laughs> pouring, so we waited. Uh, and then, it, so it could be nice now, but I have now completely covered the windows in the studio. So okay. I have no idea what the weather. Let me see on my phone if someone told me I should put a webcam out the window. That's a good idea. That is a good idea. Yeah, I was expecting rain. It was raining quite badly all morning, and now it's just lovely out there. Yeah, it's 16 and sunny, so it's quite mild. Mm -hmm. uh, not really mid-November weather here, and uh, so it's good that it's sunny. So when I leave, well, when I leave, it'll be dark, so <laughs> I'll have missed it. So Brianne and, and I, so we're uh, doing this together. Nobody else could make it today, but that's fine. That's why we have so many people exactly <laughs> on the cast, you know, and uh we we thought we had done a one together before, but I don't remember. I think right? we I think we've done at least one before. Okay, yeah, I think at least I have had a solo with each of the cast members, but I don't remember. Uh, all right, so throughout November, December, and January, all donations made to Parasites Without Borders will be matched by Parasites Without Borders and donated to Microbe TV. All right, so. If you're, you're thinking of donating before the end of the year, which a lot of people do, uh, please consider. Go to ParasitesWithoutBorders.com, ParasitesWithoutBorders.com, and there's a button in the front. It says Donate. And if you, have, if you want to mail a check, there's an address. And if you need a tax number, say you have a donor-approved fund somewhere that allows you to give money, then there's a tax number there as well. And your, your donations are tax-deductible because they are a... 501c3, and that's Daniel Griffin's company. So that would be cool if you helped us out. All right. We have three papers for you today. We have first a nano snippet, <laughs> <laughs> which is meant to be done kind of rapidly. And this one is, uh, is a uh, pre-proof in cell. So it's, it's, it's peer-reviewed, but not officially out yet. So it's a little different than right. a pre-print. <laughs> Yeah, and the and the TDF is a little wonky, right? It's mm -hmm. uh, anyway, but it's called "Visualizing in Deceased COVID-19 Patients How SARS-CoV-2 Attacks the Respiratory and Olfactory Mucosae, but Spares the Olfactory Bulb." This is from a very large number of authors. First author Mona Khan, last author Laura Van Gerven, and they are from many different countries: Germany. A lot of people from Belgium. I think that's the main place. Then we have Seattle, um, Belgium, 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 Belgium. This is mainly a Belgian study, yes. And I, this is interesting because you may remember at the very beginning of the COVID outbreak that it was recognized that some people were losing their olfactory sensation. They right? couldn't smell or taste. Uh, and um, in their in their paper, they say, well into the second year, we have no explanation how this happens. <laughs> exactly. And we should probably also mention that this paper um, has two first authors. Two first authors. Uh, Khan and you. I always mess that up. And they say an unresolved question is whether, in addition, you know, the olfactory mucosa is outside of the brain. It's in, up here in your nose. And... Uh, it's wired to the brain through nerves, but it's outside the brain. And then the question is whether those nerves would provide a conduit of virus entry into the brain. And uh, so this paper addresses this. Now, I have to say, early in the pandemic, we did a twin this week in neuroscience with a 
scientist from Harvard who had already looked at this, and he said, it looks like it's the sustentacular cells. Sustentacular cells. Yes, I remember that well because that's how I learned that there were such things as sustentacular yes, yes. cells. <laughs> so there's a lovely picture here, which I'm going to show. And, and when I edit this video, I will put it in properly. But for just now, let me see now. This is camera two. <laughs> Brianne, you may not see this I, very well. I think I see it. You see it? I okay. Do, yes. So this is just the PDF. So here's your nose, and here's some pretty SARS-CoV-2s floating in. <laughs> <laughs> They're naked, but they shouldn't be. They should be in droplets, they right? They should. And here at the top, um, I forget what this is called. This is the palate, right? Yes. I believe so. The hard palate, maybe? These are turbinates, these rough-looking things. And here is your olfactory mucosa. You have nerves there and the top of your nasal cavity that uh, sense uh, chemicals of various sorts, right? And they look sort and of like little fingers for, uh, in yellow for those who do. aren't seeing this. And they, those nerves go through the bone. That's called the cribiform plate. I bet you knew that because you teach undergrads, right? I do, but I don't teach undergrads anatomy, so. Oh, okay. And the nerves go through and then they synapse with other neurons in the olfactory bulb, which is in the brain. And that creates what's called the leptomeninges. And they also, they also have some virus particles here. Uh, they found some there, as you'll see, but they don't think they're reproducing there. And they don't think they're going any farther. So down below, the nose is split into the respiratory epithelium and the olfactory epithelium. Really nice pictures. Mm -hmm. So you can see, and they've colored the cell types beautiful, isn't it? It really is. It's, it's very helpful because this isn't something I think about a lot. And this makes it very easy for me to say, oh, okay, that's where the nerves are. That's how we're talking to the brain. Yeah. Oh, here's where the mucus comes from. Here's where um, our sensing is happening. It, it just made it really easy. So we have ciliated cells. Uh, and those are the ones they think are infected with SARS-CoV-2. Yes, which and you can And others too. Other other people as well, right? Yes, and you can tell that here because there are red viruses in those cells. Yeah, they have viruses. Then we have goblet cells which make mucus, and they don't seem to be infected. And then uh, below them all are the basal cells, and they're not infected either. So the nose has respiratory epithelium, but it also has olfactory epithelium up there by the top that we just talked about. And here we have the olfactory sensory neurons, they, they look like little hydra, don't they? They do. <laughs> and so at the very top, there's some projections which are sensing the uh, chemicals. Uh, and then the nerve body is there with the nucleus. And then the axon or dendrite goes into the brain. And then we also have sustentacular cells which surround them. Those are kind of support cells, right? They nourish the neurons. Exactly. And again, it's really nice to look at this picture because you can sort of see, of course, that's a support cell. That makes a lot of sense as you look yeah. at this diagram. Yeah. And then uh, finally, you have basal cells as well that are not infected. So where they, the, the, where they put the virions here is a result of the work they've done in this paper. And part of the problem in not understanding really where the virus is quite clearly is that, you know, it's, first of all, these, these are human experiments they want to do, right? Right. Um, and they say harvesting samples of suitable quality and unambiguous identity has been a problem from both living and deceased patients. Of course, you can imagine if the patient is alive, uh, you know what, they don't want you to taking pieces of your nasal epithelium up there, you know? Right. So that, that's hard. It's it's rather invasive and just doesn't seem like something you're want, going to want to do in a lot of patients. And then, of course, um, after a patient dies of COVID, they say typically there's a very long delay before they're able to harvest tissue. And, you know, they say the cells break, the virus is gone, and so that's a problem also. It's probably days. So what they developed here is, I have to say, it's a little bit creepy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a bedside procedure for harvesting bits of the uh, respiratory epithelium and uh, olfactory epithelium from the dead patient. Mm -hmm. um, they say we can get it. Probably virus is still there so we can see viral RNA 
and you can see the cell type. So they go in and they do some breaking and cutting and stuff, and they have to get a, um, uh, approval. Uh, what is the word? Um, not approval. Consent. Consent from the patient beforehand, obviously. Sure. Which you say, in the case of my death, I will allow this to happen. And and so as soon as they die, you know, within hours, I think they actually give us some time. So th this is a study with 68 patients in, in Belgium, mm -hmm. in the hospital. They have also 15 controls. And then they have two uh, COVID patients who recovered. And then some for some reason, they died several months later, maybe for something else, right? Right. These were mostly men, and they mostly had the comorbidities that predisposed to serious disease like obesity, diabetes, type 2, and hypertension. Um, and so they describe in great detail that we don't need to do <laughs> how they no. actually do this dissection um, but after they die. And this, the time, 67 minutes for ICU patients, 85 minutes for ward patients, and 89 for control patients. So that after they die, that's how much time elapses before they get their samples. That That's amazing. Um, I agree. It's a little, little creepy, but I can imagine that, you know, these samples are some of the uh, most appropriate and most physiologically relevant samples of this that are out there in any study. This is the kind of thing you have to do to get human data, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to put aside your creep factor. And I was thinking of this, that creeps me out that, I mean, they're, they're digging and cutting and breaking. With They're talking about using hammers to break bone and stuff, man. Right, right. So you have to put it aside if you want to learn things. And they learn a lot. So they can take these tissues back to the lab. They look for viral RNA with by in situ hybridization, where you can hybridize a nucleic acid probe to sections and look at them under a microscope. They have antibodies to stain the cell types and see what kind of cells they are, right? And they can do this for both the uh, respiratory mucosa and the uh, olfactory mucosa, right? Yes. Um, what else can, what else did they do? Um, so that's immunohistochemistry where they stain and they look under the microscope. Um, you know, I feel like this, while this may be creepy, if you told me that my nasal samples were going to be used to make really beautiful pictures for a cell paper, I think I'd be okay with that. Yeah. I, I might, yeah. But, you know, the thing is that the patient is agreeing that they might die, right? Yes. That's the creep part. Yeah, and, that is Because once you're dead, part. that's... And anyway, so they say ciliated cells are the major target in the respiratory mucosa. 27 out of the 30, 90%, they, they could see viral RNA there. So that's quite clear. And those uh, ciliated cells are the main ones. Ciliated cells. Yeah, so that's um, part of the respiratory mucosa and not the olfactory mucosa. Sustentacular cells are the main cell in the olfactory epithelium. Mm -hmm. They don't see any viral RNA in the neurons, right? Yes. In fact, one of the things they say in the <laughs> abstract is it, it's a, it appears that SARS-CoV-2 is not a neurotropic virus. And, and that's important to know given that, A, we see these issues with uh, taste and smell, but also, you know, there's this discussion of brain fog, um, it's kind of key to know that it doesn't seem like the virus is actually directly impacting neurons. That's right. Uh, they say, okay, so why do you lose your sense of smell? Maybe the, when the sustentacular cells get infected, that perturbs the neurons in some way, right? Mm -hmm. so they actually do transcriptomic analysis of gene expression in the neurons, olfactory sensory neurons. Um, and they don't really find any differences, right? Right. So it's not at that kind of level that you're going to see something. No changes in olfactory receptor gene expression level in high versus low COVID even. Then they found RNA in this leptomeningeal layer. So those are just below the olfactory bulb. They found viral RNA there, but um, they don't. What did, they, what did they say? I forgot what they say. They don't feel that it's reproducing there. Um, and they don't feel that it's spreading from there. They don't see it anywhere else. So they say it's not a neurotropic virus in the sense that it does not infect uh, sense olfactory neurons and... Uh, um, 
An olfactory bulb neurons, yes. An olfactory bulb neurons, yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, I think that there is a lot of knowledge coming out about the leptomeninges. I think that it does have some immune functions, although I'm not completely up to date on all of that. So I think that it's also mm. just generally kind of interesting. Now, it's interesting that two other human coronavirus that also bind to ACE2, right? SARS-CoV and, and NL63, they don't cause anosmia. It's interesting, right? Mm -hmm. It really is. Yeah. And so, you know, it'd be interesting to kind of figure out which aspects of the biology of that are making that impact and how much of that is related to these effects yeah. on the sustenticular cells. Then they put in this sentence, which I thought was funny. They say, admittedly, the absence of evidence for infection of olfactory sensory neurons does not constitute evidence of absence. <laughs> <laughs> we leave the possibility open that these neurons may become infected uh, in a, maybe a subset of patients, which is just being careful, I suppose. But. Sure. And, and, you know, they are looking at patients, of course, by definition, who are kind of late in the disease course. Yeah. So uh, they should also put that caveat as they correctly do. Now they do say our data do not support the neurotropic properties and neuroinvasive capacity that have been attributed by some to SARS-CoV-2. And a number of people have suggested that the virus is neurotropic, mainly from infections of brain organoids and so forth, mm -hmm. um, which is tricky because it's not the brain, right? So you have right. to be very careful. But do you remember we had a neurologist on TWIV, Kieran Thacker? Yes, I was just going to say Kieran something. She also said that we don't see any, because they did another a similar study, of, but of autopsies, right? Where yes. they looked in the brain proper and they looked for viral and they didn't really find anything. And she yeah. said, no, I, I don't think it's neurotropic. I think all these effects are cytokines and uh, hypoxia, right? That That's my take as well. And I don't think I've seen any data from any studies that have indicated that this was a neurotropic yeah. virus other than, or at least any in vivo types of studies. So they do make this interesting uh, statement, which I didn't know. Uh, a genome-wide association study has been done, uh, which means you, you sequence genomes of people who have lost smell or taste or not, who are SARS-CoV-2 positive, 70,000. That's so cool. I didn't know about that either until reading yeah, this I paper. Didn't. And I really want to go back and look at this 23andMe study. But they say a single locus was associated with the loss of smell, and it has genes encoding UDP glucuronosyl transferase enzymes. And in the rat, these are involved in odorant metabolism. So that's consistent, right? Yeah, with, exactly. Uh, so who knows what's going on with this one? I guess they didn't see any changes in the levels of this, but they did see, what did they say? Um... They see some uh, clustering of this transcript, right? Right. And so there could be some changes, you know, in how exactly it's signaling or something like that. And so that's an interesting clue there. Yeah, I would be interested to know, you know, how that impacts sustenticular cells and smell and taste in general in human cells, not just the rat cells. So then they say the mucosal immune system, in, in view of the location of these sustentacular cells, the immune system may not be able to prevent infection. Um, so even if you've been vaccinated or recovered, you may not have local antibodies there, right? Right, because you need nasal responses yeah. in order to protect these cells. So didn't we say once on an episode that there are not many antibodies in the nasal cavity? I think there are relatively few antibodies in the nasal cavity, especially mm -hmm. compared to the lung. I, you know, they are yeah. two completely different compartments immunologically. So they say if you've been infected and recovered or vaccinated, you're probably going to get a little bit of uh, reproduction in those cells. So they say may, vaccination may not prevent uh, olfactory dysfunction. That's interesting. It is. I, I haven't heard of any of these infections leading to loss of smell, have you? I haven't either. I wonder if there's a question of how much uh, virus is needed to cause this change yeah. in the cells. So maybe vaccination is helping to knock down the amount of virus a little bit. Oh, yeah. I think that's the case that the loads are lower. Yeah. Right. So then so, maybe you don't get yeah. above the amount needed. It's, it's a nice fire alarm, right? It's it is a really nice fire alarm. Um, it's, you know, 
many of them seem much more annoying than that. Yeah. Well, I think that's the point, right? They don't annoy you. <laughs> um, anyway, that's uh, – there you go. That's a nano snippet. I think that was a nice paper. It's actually nicely written. Mm-hmm. It's kind of conversational in a way. It is. Right? And uh, I think the, the findings are important. So it's, a, it's an interesting – Technique. Oh, did, did they? They gave it a name, didn't they? Which the so the technique for getting the, these things? Uh, let me see if I can find oh, it. What did they call that? Um, that's in cell. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, they, they did name it something. I want to tell you the name. Um, Post mortem bedside surgical procedure. Okay. Yes, that's what I saw. That's what it is. It's not really a specific name. But it could be anything, but. All right, so now we have a snippet, and and when I, I recognized that it would just be me and Brianne, I said, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, have an immunology paper here. When this paper uh, was published, when I first saw this paper, I was so happy um, because I was thinking, finally, they're looking at some of the details of memory T cells um, following vaccines. We spend a lot of time looking at the antibody responses and... I was really excited to finally get to see some data on the T cells too. So, and and the thing is, this is a published paper, Science Immunology. It's been peer reviewed, and it was submitted a while ago, right? Mm -hmm. So this is yes. a six month follow up after vaccination. So now we are beyond six months, but and so I prefer to look at the peer reviewed final papers because they've had to do extra experiments or fixed writing or whatever. Mm -hmm. So this is BNT162B2 vaccination induces durable SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells with a stem cell memory phenotype. And we have one, two co-first authors, Gisela Guerrera and Mario Picozza. And um, the corresponding authors are Luca Battistini and Giovanna Borsellino. <laughs> I get to practice my Italian. Isn't I know. I there was no way I was going to try to say those. I, that was definitely something to leave for you. And they're from a variety of places in Rome. Yeah, all in Rome. So, um, and this is also really nicely written, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is. It's uh, clear writing and nice use of words, and I'll point them out. Um, yes. so apparently, we when in, apparently, when in Rome, you do great T cell immunology. I di I didn't know that. I think lots lots of people are doing T cells, but this just happens to be from Rome. Yeah. All right. So we've talked a lot about T cells on TWIV. In fact, um, we had Alessandro Setti. We had Shane Crotty who do work on T cells. Um, we know that they are induced by both infection and vaccination. People have used peptides to say they're virus-specific T cells. They, they seem to be very important, right? They say here, actually, despite the decline in antibody levels, protection from severe de disease and hospitalization remains high, suggesting that cellular immunity is responsible, right? Because if the antibodies are going away... <laughs> Right. And and we've had this whole conversation about it's not just about antibodies, it's about memory B cells and how many memory B cells you have to make those antibodies later. Um, but of course, it's also about the memory T cells That's right. Um, to make a good T cell right. memory response. So these studies that we've talked about with the peptide pools, those are effector T cells mm -hmm. in the blood, right? Exactly. Yes. And this, this paper is looking at memory. They're going to look at those also in antibodies just to make a full study, but they're looking at memory T cells of mm -hmm. different kinds, right? And they, they say something here, um, which harkens back to a, a paper Karate and company published last year. Studies on immune memory to other coronas have shown that cellular immunity can be detected for up to 17 years after initial infection in the absence of antibodies. Isn't that amazing? 17 that is, years. Yes. Um, there are a few different studies on the length of responses that we can see with T cells. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a couple of really famous ones looking at uh, T cell responses to smallpox vaccines. Right. Um, and they, while there's some controversy, they are out to 75 years in some cases. Wow. Um, so some people, you know, have questions with some of those data. It's, you know, older patients who were vaccinated as kids and memory T cells can still be found in them many years after vaccination. 
You know, I have a table in one in my vaccines lecture which shows uh, persistence of antibodies for different viruses, and mm-hmm. some of those go out forty years. Also, you can detect a little bit of serum antibodies right. still. Um, right. I, strangely enough, this uh, was in my lecture today, this uh, earlier today, and so I mm. had the slide up that actually showed all of those data, um, and yeah. it's, it's fascinating. And in some for some. And, you know, the viruses that have a viremic phase, they tend to do the longer lasting uh, antibodies, whereas Mm -hmm. the mucosal viruses, they kind of go down and out very quickly. So it's interesting why that would be, right? Yes. So this study, uh, 71 healthcare workers and scientists vaccinated with the Pfizer vaccine, uh, two doses, and they were followed up to six months because that's when this paper was submitted, you know, after the six months. And presumably they're looking longer. But right now we have six months. So they looked at their various antibodies and uh, T-cells, but they also look at memory T-cells. So they have three time points. They have, and this is serum, which they say, you know, in the limitations paragraph, you know, this is what we can do. Uh, We can get blood and it may not tell us everything, right? Right. Because it's easy. I I will say... um, the one thing that I did find a little confusing about this paper, so it was well written, except that this confused me uh, mm-hmm. upon first read, was the way they had described the time points. Um, because they are T0, and then... That's, that's before anything, that's right? That's before anything, so that's yeah. pre-vaccine. Day of boost is T1, so really that's 21 days after first vaccine. Yeah, well, it's funny, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a weird way of saying it. So that's 21 days after the first vaccine. Then T2 is 14 days later. So it's, or five weeks, I guess, post first vaccine, but also with a second vaccine in there. And then the other one is six months after first dose. That is weird. Yeah. And so it's then six months after T0, I guess, but, which is not yeah. actually. T1, so it's five months after T. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So baseline that must have taken blood just before they got vaccinated. Right? Exactly. That's what you would mm-hmm. usually do. And so I just, I remember as I was reading this the first time, having to spend longer than I expected trying to figure out yeah. exactly what those time points were. So they they look for antibody, anti-receptor binding domain antibodies at baseline and then second dose. And 100% of these people had antibodies after the second dose. None of them had antibodies at baseline, which is not surprising because this is a very specific RBD, right? You Mm -hmm. wouldn't expect it to cross-react. It's going to be different later on, as you'll see. It's quite interesting. Um, So, okay, all these people made antibodies, and they they looked at them over these time points, and they say they do decrease, but even at six months, they're pretty good. Right. (laughs) Right? Um, All they continue is not lost. To, they do continue to decrease, although I think it depends on the person. Like Condit said, he had an antibody test and it was really high over a year after his uh, vaccine. So it depends on the person, right? Yeah, and I, I still don't think that we know with those numbers exactly you know, what is high enough. And so oh, it could sure, be really sure. high, but what those numbers mean is we, really we don't not know clear. That. Yeah, exactly. So a, a, a waning dose may not really matter. But right. All right, so then they um, looked at the T cell, and they look at spike-specific T cells. So we're looking at effector cells in the blood. They have pools of peptides spanning the spike protein. And by the way, folks, you know, Amy and I are pricing out a peptide pool experiment. Ooh. Uh, We're going to – so listen to this, Brie, and we're going to – we want to pull out antibodies to uh, enteroviruses Mm -hmm. in both mice and people – so in the mice, we're taking out the spleen after immunization, and we're going to use the peptides to pull out B cells and then sequence them, right? Sure. And then when people, we get peripheral blood B cells and do the same thing. Uh, just to do peptides over one of the four capsid proteins is enormously expensive. Wow. And if you, you know, we see these papers, you know, we span the whole genome. This is Probably $100,000 or something. It's really That's expensive. That's amazing, yeah. Really expensive. Peptide pools. We just throw away around the word, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. So In graduate school, we just had some. I never knew how much Yeah. Well, how she, much she, I said, why don't you just make peptides to the known antigenic sites and just do a proof of concept? She said, no, no, no. It's, uh, 
it's, we have to do the whole thing because you, you want to know if you can pull it out among the background of all the peptides. Sure. Okay, so then they uh, want to look at this antigen-specific T cell response by looking at different markers, right? Mm -hmm. And activation-induced markers, which they call AIM, and intracellular cytokine staining. So these are things that are characteristic of of uh, virus of T cells, right, in the blood. Yeah, and correct? this is and this is kind of related to the idea of thinking about the peptide pools. Um, so if you were going to think about T-cells responding to just one antigen, just one peptide from spike, for example. You'd have to have people who all had the same MHC type, and you could have a reagent to tell you about CD8 T-cells responding to just that antigen. Right. But here, they're looking at all T-cells responding to um, those peptides in the peptide pool. So they can't measure responses to just one antigen, mm -hmm. and their people are are not all the same MHC type. So basically what they have to do instead of looking at um, the individual T cells that right. might be responding, they just have to look at our T cells changing their activation in general. And they're assuming that any T cells that are um, expressing these activation markers must Got have it. been activated by the peptides in the peptide pool. And so they use some specific activation markers for CD4s and for CD8s um, to just tell them what percent of CD4s or CD8s were activated in response to this pool. Um, Got it. So they don't have to look at antigen specificity. And so they find that almost all the donors have these AIM positive, CD4 positive at baseline, which is correct. You should, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And... They are expanded sixfold by 21 days after the first dose of vaccine. Right. And then further stimulated at 14 days after the boost, right? So yes. that's what you would expect to happen because they're responding to the vaccine, correct? Right. That's exactly what you would expect. And then after their teeth, six months, that are six month time point, uh, these cells, AIM plus, CD4 plus, were still fivefold higher and they were found in all donors. Mm hmm. Now, in contrast, the CD8 were only an 18% at baseline. So why is that? Um, so like compared to CD4, they're much lower, right? Yeah, so I can give you my perspective on that, but uh, I could be a little off here. I think that the <laughs> CD... <laughs> my, my answer is that um, if you look at how CD8 T cells recognize their antigen, um, they are recognizing... Uh, a much more specific peptide. Um, they they are really recognizing some specific amino acids in that peptide. And so you're less likely to get some cross-reactive um, activation. So, okay. you know, they at baseline, they haven't given the cells um, much to uh, respond to yet. And so those uh, cells may have needed more. Um, they also may, may have needed something like a, a CD28 additional signal in order to become activated. Um, whereas with the CD4s, uh, they they you know have the ability to have some cross-reactive CD4s reacting here. Nevertheless, uh, when these individuals get vaccinated, these cells go up too, uh, even though they're only in eighteen percent of donors. By vaccination, they're eighty-seven percent have spike-specific CD8 cells. They've expanded after the second dose, and they're detectable after six months in 88% of the donors. So these are effector cells that are still around, right? That's, that's well, interesting. Yeah, we. I mean, that's the, the tricky question here is, are they effector cells? Are they memory cells? What are they? They're okay. certainly cells that have seen antigen. Okay. But they do look for memory cells in a bit yeah, by, other, so, by so other markers, right? Yeah. Later on, they say, are they effector cells? Are they memory cells? Okay, okay. Um. And then they, they they start to decrease after so many months, um, but um, they they also calculate what's called a stimulation index, the ratio of AIM positive T cells in stimulated over unstimulated mm -hmm. samples. They use that as a way to figure out T cell activation. Right. So, right. how many folds did the T cells expand? Yeah. And so they go those, through those numbers. I don't think we need to go through them, but basically um, they go up after priming and boosting and then they go down a bit afterwards. But most of the patients do uh, have these, these stimulation responses. And they also find that the, the antibody and cellular responses follow, you, follow different kinetics, which you would expect, right? Yes, that is exactly um, what you expect. I had that in some slides this morning. So they say the 
number of CD4 cells 21 days after priming is the best predictive of, predictor of antibody levels. As they say, as you would expect from a T cell dependent B cell response. This is great, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think this makes a point that we've made before that there are some data about antibodies um, as a correlate of protection. And uh, we've said that antibodies may be a correlate, but not necessarily the correlate because we haven't measured every single possible response. And here they say the CD4 cell response at uh, this particular time point is very uh, much correlated with the antibody response. And so right, perhaps the right. CD4 response is also a correlate of protection. So their conclusion, here's the conclusion, if you missed a lot of what we just said. Vaccination induces detectable and robust antigen-specific T-cells that develop before high antibody titers, with most T-cell expansion occurring after the first dose and persisting for up to eight months. Brian, do you think if this study were done with, say, an adenovirus vectored vaccine, if it would be generally, the results would be generally similar? Um, I think it would be generally pretty similar uh, based on what I've seen, but it's been a while since I've looked at some of those data. Yeah, because adenoviruses are particularly good at inducing T cell responses. They, they are. Yeah. So, but these, the mRNA vaccine seems to be also, right? Yes, but in, in either case, um, you're making the uh, spike protein in dendritic cells so yeah. that you can present to T cells very well. And so if we're comparing mRNA and adenovirus, they're both going to give you better T cells than say a protein-based vaccine. Okay. Uh, they then look at um, cytokine production by these spike T cells by flow cytometry, right? Mm -hmm. So these are markers of uh, CD4 and CD8 cells. Interferon gamma is another one. Um, I will just give you the uh, summary. They say vaccination induces emergence of a CD4 and CD8 cytokine response by T cells after priming, while full effector functions marked by polyfunctionality are acquired following the boost and then maintained for at least six months. Yes. So what is polyfunctionality? So polyfunctionality means that a T cell is able to produce more than one cytokine when it's stimulated. Okay. So the idea is that um, at the prime, the T cells maybe only make, say, interferon gamma. Mm -hmm. And at the boost, the T cells make interferon gamma and TNF and granzyme B or something like okay. that. And in other studies, uh, polyfunctional T cells tend to be kind of the ones that are the most active the, and the best able to control viruses. So that's good. Yes, we want polyfunctional responses. And so they say you need a boost to do that. It's interesting, right? Yes. So you get huh. some T cells, but those yeah. T cells differentiate better into those polyfunctional cells uh, upon boost. Now, um, I noticed one of the uh, intracellular markers they look for is granzyme B, which is associated mm -hmm. with cytotoxic T lymphocytes, It right? is, yes. Uh, so that's they need that to kill infected cells, right? Yes, yes. And okay. one of the other markers that they look at, which is just a cool marker, is um, CD107A. <laughs> um, and the reason why that's cool is if anyone is a cell biology person who doesn't think about immunology at all, you may know about LAMP1. Um, CD107A is actually LAMP1. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea is you have this little cytotoxic granule that contains the granzyme B. Right, right, And it happens to have proteins in its surface, it's including uh -huh. LAMP1. And when the cell tries to secrete granzyme B, that little vessel fuses with the cell membrane. And right. so you're actually looking at the result of a vessel fusing with the cell membrane. Got you it. have this on the surface, yeah. it's showing you, yeah, we had some, some vessels or some, some vesicles actually uh, – I see. So you look for a surface lamp one, right? Exactly. Ah, that's cool. That's very cool. Um, okay, so next they look at different kinds of T cells, right? Mm -hmm. They call this differentiation features of spike specific T cells. So they look again at markers that would define naive T cells. Those are ones that don't see have not seen any. Yes, viral so they have foreign. not seen any uh, thing. They are completely naive. They're not activated. Then we have central memory. We have effector memory, and then we have terminally differentiated effector. 
Yes. So those are the ones we've been looking at, the spike-specific ones in the blood that make granzyme and so forth. Exactly. Right? So those cells are relatively short-lived, and their biggest job is to make a whole lot of cytokines and a whole lot of cytotoxic mediators. So remind us, what's the difference between central and effector memory? So, <laughs> so the cells I just mentioned are effector cells. Right. Um, central and effector memory cells are two kinds of memory cells. So they are longer lived, but they differ based on some of their properties. The effector memory cells are a little closer to being effector cells. Okay. The central memory cells are really often talked about as sort of the stem cells almost, and they get into stem cell memory here, um, that can become effector cells or effector memory cells um, okay. or other types. And one other big difference between effector memory and central memory cells is where they live. Mm -hmm. Central memory cells mostly spend time in things places like the lymph node, where they can look for antigens kind of in the same places as naive cells are. The effector memory cells spend more time in tissues. So they might be in the lung um, while the central memory cells are in the lymph node. So I hear people talk about tissue resident memory cells, TRMs. Mm -hmm. Is that the same as uh, central memory? No. So both, so central memory, effector memory, and resident memory are different. Okay. And they, so both central memory and effector memory spend some time in the blood. Um, in okay. so central spend some time in the blood or lymph nodes. Does they didn't look for TRMs here? No, right? because what you you they don't those are not in the blood. Okay, and so you'd did, actually have to look in the nose, like they did in the previous paper. Or what Donna Farber does, she gets cadavers and exactly. looks for them. Right? Yeah, so you have to actually eyes. be able to look in the tissue because the okay. resident memories don't spend any time in the blood. So they say here, I love this sentence, among the desirable outcomes of vaccination lies the generation of a pool of memory stem cells. Yes. Uh, isn't that good? Lies in it. That's a really nice way to say it, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, so basically they find these uh, they different types, right? They And they conclude that vaccination induces a T cell population with features of longevity, mm -hmm. which remain numerically stable in the peripheral blood for at least six months and predict future T cell responses. They do. And I, when I looked at these data, it seemed as though the responses were even, in some cases, going a little more towards that central memory response mm -hmm. as they got later, mm -hmm. which is great. And so that also said to me, oh, this response kind of evolves a little bit over time, just like we've seen with the B cell response. And it takes some time to improve to be a great response. All right. And the last thing they do is to look at um, phenotypic changes occurring in these AIM positive T cells after boosting and then up to that six month time point. And they have used flow cytometry to quantify all these markers, lots of different markers. And then they use computational approaches to, uh, to look at that. And they conclude that um, these antigen specific T cells acquire phenotypic features of activation and functional capacity after the booster. And most of these are less evident and partially replaced in the long run by characteristics distinctive of more quiescent memory cells. So basically, shortly t after you get vaccinated, you have these uh, effector T cells, and then they transition to memory, right? Yeah, well, either they transition to memory or the effector cells die and the cells that are that exactly, live yes, are memory right. cells. Whether they actually right. were effector cells in the past is... Uh, yeah, you don't know that, right? So is, what, what you can say is the population has shifted, yeah. Yeah, and I think most people in the field think that it's the population has shifted. And so that's what you want to happen, right? That, because you don't need to have effectors floating around all the time, right? Exactly. You don't want to have effectors floating around all the time. You want to save the lymph node space and the ATP for the, your responses to the next virus. And you want to have really good memory cells. And it looks like you get two doses, you get that boost, um, and then you wait some time and you have great memory cells. Right. So they conclude that um, we can find for up to six months, spike specific uh, and memory function, effector and memory T cells in the blood for up to six months. And these agree with what other people have found uh, in, in uh, other laboratories, which is good. Right, And it mm -hmm. also agrees with people studying the T-cells after infection, 
right? Yes. Which is nice that it's congruent, right? Yes. Now, this is an interesting part here. In our cohort, nearly all individuals had spike-specific T-cells at baseline. Hey, baseline, that's before the vaccine. Yes. <laughs> so they say it's likely due to the presence of a pool of memory clones cross-reactive with other coronaviruses. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you take these peptide pools of spikes, you're going to get some peptides that are going to be similar to other coronaviruses. That's the idea. And they right. will identify T cells in your experiments. And, and if you remember, they had what looked like more of that in their uh, pool of CD4 positive T cells compared to their CD8 positive T cells. Mm -hmm. uh, and so maybe you have more, um, which again makes sense based on how yeah. CD4 is recognized. And so they think this is probably due to endemic common cold coronaviruses that have been described before. In particular, Shane Crotty described that. Yep. Remember last year, and then the press went crazy saying, if you had a common cold corona, you're going to be protected. Right, exactly. <laughs> and he tried to say, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. Right, exactly. <laughs> but uh, they're there. And I mean, it's important to find out because uh, there are obviously some conserved epitopes, right? Mm -hmm. Let's see. So... Um, they're very positive, I think. And so you get these polyfunctional cells as well, which have, as you said, they're good to have. We have memory cells. Um, interesting, they didn't uh, find a difference in, in males and females in uh, vaccine-induced immunity, which is found in other studies, yes. right? Yes, yes. Yeah, females have a higher response typically. Mm -hmm. I remember um, Sabra Klein. Sabra Klein. Her work on this is just fascinating. I've always enjoyed it. So this seems to be evolutionarily conserved, maybe to uh, allow reproduction, right? Yeah, that that does seem like the idea. It does seem like in general, females have higher immune responses in a lot of cases. Males have a little bit lower, yeah. um, which is also bad because females then get predisposed maybe to autoimmune disease, where males get predisposed to excess uh, disease from infection. So they say then, as I mentioned, um, this is just all in the blood, and so... Uh, mucosal lymphocytes may be different. And, so no uh, resident just, memory cells. No resident memory cells. Um, now, th this is the one, um, this is a beautifully written paragraph. After the boost, the peak of the response shows a fully activated cytotoxically empowered. <laughs> Don't you love that? Yes. Those are the granzyme positive cells, right? I'm, I'm going to be using that. Uh, cytotoxically future, empowered yes. is great. <laughs> Multifunctional T cell population, including tails of the T follicular uh, helper phenotype. And we didn't talk about those. We've talked about those before. We have, yes. Th those are the ones you need for antibody responses. Those are the, right? the B cells that help out T cells. Or sorry, yeah. reverse that. Those are the yeah. T cells that help out B cells to make good antibody responses. At this time point, the highest levels of anti RBD antibodies are detected in the serum. What remains after six months? is a population of T cells with features of polyfunctionality and markers of TFH cells. Mm -hmm. At this time point, spike-specific T cells, which have survived the immunological contraction, that's another one I really like. Oh, contraction phase is very important. Are highly specific and theoretically prone to give rise to effective and rapid antiviral responses. So the contraction has to do not only with T cells, but antibodies, right? Yeah, so, all, so that's, you have contraction of both your... Um, T cells, and you have a contraction of your B cells. And when you have fewer B cells, you make less antibody. So I would rather the press used contraction rather than waning. What do you think? I, um, having done some experiments to look at contraction, <laughs> uh, I certainly would prefer they use contraction because that is the term that immunologists use. And yeah, but waning sounds important. like something's wrong, right? Right, exactly. It's just like a breakthrough. Sounds like something has gone remiss. And I don't like breakthrough or waning. Right. No, you have to have your responses contract. Um, yeah. If they don't contract, there's there's an autoimmune disease where contraction doesn't happen and bad things happen yeah. to you. So then they say this is in line with clinical real world data showing that vaccine effectiveness in preventing severe COVID is maintained above 90% for at least six months. And we know for longer now because that's mm -hmm. still the case today. Um. Protection from infection does, here's, here's um, it's not here actually, but protection from infection does decline and likely correlates to weaning antibody. Is, weaning is waning. not a word. Yeah, I, I think, think it's waning. waning. Yeah, which provide an, an immediate shield against infection. Yeah. 
And we just don't maintain those immediate shields, folks. Sorry. Right. Well, and this makes sense because T cells um, are recognizing virus that is inside of cells getting presented. And so you have to have an infected cell before the T cell does anything. The shield is the antibodies that blocks that virus from ever getting into cells in the first place. So the shield goes away, but you still have, as I think Rich would say, a fire extinguisher. Yeah, and I think that's where the narrative has gone awry in in concluding, and it's not just people, but the health authorities are saying it's waning and this is a problem, this is why we have to boost, and I just don't, I don't think that's right, right? Yeah, I, you know, I've gone different directions on the boost, I've heard some data in both ways, but there's nothing that I've really seen that says that any part of these vaccine-elicited T-cell or B-cell responses are inadequate. They look like great responses from data like this. Yeah. Uh, now they finally conclude by saying we've shown a sizable population of TSCM. What's SCM again? Stem cell memory. Is promptly induced, but whether these provide added protection on exposure remains to be established. So we don't know if they're going to help out? We don't totally know if they're going to help out. Um, there's some sort of debate, but the idea okay. is that those stem cell memory cells could become any of the other types. So I guess they can't become naive, but they can become effector cells. They can become other kinds of memory cells. Okay. Um, so that's why they're called the stem cell memories. So vaccines work, folks. Vaccines work. <laughs> uh, the immune system works as we thought. Um, but these are some fabulous data that actually show things that I've been teaching for years. So I was yes, very really nice. excited about this paper. Yeah, we have a real world opportunity to do this now, right? Mm -hmm. Because big problem, lots of people infected, lots of opportunity. Whereas in the normal time... You know, you may have a little flu here and there, but maybe not easy to get specimens and so forth. Yeah, so this is... Lots of people, um, we know that they were largely naive before all of this. Um, we are able to use some really sophisticated immunological techniques. And so uh, there has been a lot of really nice immunology um, where we have data to show many of the mm -hmm. things that are in textbooks. All right. That was a very nice paper. It was. I really enjoyed that. And then finally, uh, we have another science paper, an oral SARS-CoV-2 M pro inhibitor, clinical candidate for the treatment of COVID-19. And this is um, from Pfizer, different locations throughout the world. And the um, first author is Daffid Owen. And the corresponding author is Daffid Owen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That's interesting. Um, okay. And lots of other people in between. And I was discussing this with Doris last night, who used to be in the farm industry. And she said, this is a great example of why making antivirals is hard. Yeah. I'm going to, we're going to tell you this and, um, you're going to see why it's hard, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's interesting. In the beginning, they immediately say, uh, we have vaccines, but a lot of people won't take them. So we need to have some antivirals for them. That's an interesting idea, right? Sure. And, you know, there unfortunately are situations where even those who are vaccinated might need an antiviral. Sure. Because it's not 100%. It's absolutely right. I mean, you can imagine. So if you are fully vaccinated, even with three doses, and you have an infection, you might want to take, especially if you have comorbidities that mm -hmm. predispose you, you might want to take an antiviral. Sure. Right? So immunocompromised individuals, all sorts of folks might need this. Now, we do have uh, monoclonals available, but those are intravenously or maybe now intramuscularly or subcutaneously administered, right? Mm -hmm. um, not available to everyone. So you need an, other things. And antivirals could fill the bill, fit the, that void, fill that void. Now, we don't have any good antivirals so far, right? We have repurposed, we have tried repurposed drugs and most of them don't work. Remdesivir is the only one that kind of works a little. Even Daniel's not excited about it, right. but it has to be given intravenously. Right. And the only other one that's out there is, you know, Molnupiravir, which is relatively recent and also has uh, that's right. its places of debate. So, yeah, Molnupiravir in this drug. Um, which has a number in this paper, but now it has an actual name. Um, they're kind of neck and neck in development. They'll both mm -hmm. probably receive EUAs more or less at the same time, maybe later this year. Um, 
So we may have two, and the key here is they're both going to be orally available. You can take a pill, right? And so that may, I mean, Daniel is already saying this is a game changer, but I hear that word too much. So I don't know. <laughs> but it you will know? be really helpful in terms of people being able to take it at home. And not, yeah, you just have yeah. to take it within, I don't know, five days of your test positive. You sure. have to take it quickly. Sort of like Tamiflu for influenza. You need to take that within 48 hours or else mm -hmm. it doesn't work. So the, the Pfizer, the, the Molnupiravir, which we've talked about, is a, it targets the RNA polymerase and, and causes it to make mutations and then the virus can't reproduce. It has too many mutations. But the Pfizer drug is an inhibitor of the protease. And the, the G, viral genome on the left side encodes two polyproteins. A polyprotein is a big protein that has to be chopped up to make the individual proteins that have some function. And on the left, those include the RNA polymerase and accessory proteins. So that's very important. And the protease that does that is a virus protease. It's called either 3CL or M pro, M for main. And it cleaves 11 different times to give you all the, the other proteins. And this is a cysteine protease. What does that mean? Well, cysteine is an amino acid. And this has cysteine and histidine in the active site. The active site is where the cutting occurs. And many proteases are cysteine proteases. There are also serine proteases, right, and, and other yeah. types. And, and for people who are not really up to date or up on all of this information, many viruses have proteases yeah. um, because they um, will make their proteins um, as basically one large protein that they need to cut up. Um, Mm -hmm. Just because uh, something is a protease um, doesn't mean it's necessarily the same. So HIV has a protease and we use drugs that are protease inhibitors. Um, but those are specific to HIV's protease um, and not the ones in our cells or the ones that are part of SARS-CoV-2. Right. And so this one is a, is a protease inhibitor. So you can think of the similarity to the HIV drugs, but it's not the same protease. So it right. would not inhibit the HIV proteases. And hep C as well. So for HIV and hep C, we have proteases that we use to treat, and they're very successful. Now, the poliovirus, picornaviruses also encode proteases. Um, uh, we don't have any inhibitors, while polio is almost eradicated. So, <laughs> And there are other viruses that could use an inhibitor, but they're so quick that by the time you diagnose them, it's too late to even treat them. But what's interesting here is that this M protease of SARS-CoV-2 coronaviruses in general cuts after a glutamine. It's the same thing in at least polio. The, one of the main cleavage sites is glutamine glycine. It cuts just in between them. And they say here that no known human cysteine protease cuts after glutamine. And why is that important? Because Maybe the, your inhibitor won't have a lot of side effects because it won't be inhibiting a, a cell protease, right? Yeah, that's a really exciting piece. Yeah. Okay, so now um, the, the thing about this drug, it's called PF0083523. Rolls off the tongue. It was identified for SARS-CoV-1. How many years ago? A long time. Almost and this is, kind of, this is kind of sad. Um, so in response to the 2002 outbreak, we started to look for protease inhibitors. Um, and so they made the protease, they made recombinant SARS-CoV-1 protease, and they identified this drug, which is the f number one. It's actually the first in a series of drugs. It, the number six is what ends up going into people. So they make a lot of changes. But this drug was identified years ago. And then when SARS-1 outbreak ended, they put it on the shelf and stopped. Why? Because no virus, there's no market, right? These are for-profit companies. But it's, it's sad, isn't it? Because this could have been developed further and been available. Right. And, you know, it, it's unfortunate that they were not thinking about the thing that we now know with oh, our yes, additional of information of viruses from this family are probably important. So maybe we should think about inhibitors of such. But this inhibitor, if they had developed it for SARS-1, it would yeah. have inhibited two. Right, exactly. Sure. The question is, the, would it inhibit a future one or two? Because the area, the active site 
is 100% conserved between SARS-CoV-1 and 2. And that's where this drug binds, as you will see. So then they pulled this drug out of the whatever, wherever they kept it, <laughs> and they threw it onto recombinant protease from SARS-CoV-2, inhibit, inhibits it, inhibits infection in cell culture, um, infecting zero, vero cells. They have very good activity, nanomolar activity, EC50, the effective concentration to inhibit 50% CPE is 230 nanomolar, which is very good. Um, and um, they also, um, all right, so it works in cells to, to stop infection. Um, but number com this compound is not orally absorbed very well. So when you find that out, you could do two things. You could say, okay, we'll give it intravenously, <laughs> and then that's a problem. Or you could do some chemistry. Yes. And you, you would lose the game changer ability, so you do some chemistry instead. You do some chemistry, and you can change the molecule and make it more orally available, which means when it goes into your gastrointestinal tract, it's absorbed and gets into the bloodstream, right? Which remdesivir doesn't do very well. Um and, or, and you have to balance that with keeping activity, right? You don't want to lose the activity <laughs> against the protease, right? So chemists know what to do. They have so much experience. These medicinal chemists know exactly what to do. And they say we perfude two functional groups with, ex we know, our covalent warheads for cysteine proteases, <laughs> nitriles and benzothiazolyl ketones, Okay. All you need to know is they could mess with these groups and change the properties. And they made compound two, which had more oral availability, but didn't inhibit as well as one. And so then they'd make compound three. Uh, and then the this one didn't have good potency. They say this the inferior potency precluded further investment in this <laughs> We didn't want to spend any more money on it. So they make more changes, and uh, they eventually get to number six, PF0732132, a potent inhibitor. Um, the KI is three nanomolar. That is amazing. Really That's very good. potent. And the antiviral activity, the EC50, is 74 nanomolar, so it's better than compound one. Um it, it uh, binds in the active site of the protease. And um, they decided that and compound find had good pro properties as well. But this is also important to sort out. We selected number six over compound five based on ease of synthesis, enhanced solubility so we could uh, make a simple formulation in the pill, and reduced propensity for epimerization of the molecules to go to its, its various forms, right? So, I mean, all of this took some time, right? And it's expensive to do all of this. And that's, whereas a vaccine may not have required all these iterations, right? Yeah, and it's a, it, this is a really nice, you know, everything we've just said is basically described on one page of their uh, paper. Yeah. And it's a really nice sort of way to think through what, some parts of the drug design process look like. Mm -hmm. And so if people are less familiar with it, um, it's sort of all laid out here about many of the things that get considered. But it's not over yet. There's more. Mm -hmm. All right. So this number six, inhibit, it inhibits the protease from all coronaviruses known to infect humans. Not just beta coronavirus, which is your SARS-2, 1, HKU, OC43, MERS, but also alphas. 229E, NL63, no inhibition of, of cellular proteases of different kinds that they checked. I asked Doris, how do you do that? She said, you send it to a company and they do it for you. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is outsourced, you know? Yeah, of course. But you have to pay for it. Uh, then they look at the effect of this drug in cells on reproduction of the virus. They look at uh, A549, which are... A uh, lung cancer cell line, human, and then they have a a, a bronchial epithelial cell that they use as well. Um, 
and they very good. So now they're doing EC90 as well as EC50. So EC90 is a higher bar to get 90% inhibition rather than 50%. And, and that's important because that uh, sort of helps you deal with resistance a little bit. Um, you're somewhat less likely to get resistance if you're at EC90. So EC50, 78 nanomolar, uh, EC90, 215. So you need more to a higher concentration to get 90% inhibition. That's fine. No cytotoxicity, up to three micromolar, which is much higher than the EC50, so mm -hmm. that's good. Um, and so they're looking at it. They infect cells in the presence of the drug, and they look at virus yields. So they're actually measuring uh, virus infectivity. Um, and they also looked at it, these similar assays against SARS-1, MERS, 229E, uh, e using CPE assays. And they also have very good uh, potency. All right, so that's cells. Looks good in cells. Potent, no apparent side effects. The cells don't die, right? <laughs> right. Well, and this is also pretty cool because this is working against MERS and this is working against 229E, yeah. which, you know, potentially they tell us earlier on that they see um, activity against the proteases from 229E yeah. and NL63 and HKU1 and OC43. So, Potentially, if this drug works out, it could be used against some of the common cold coronaviruses. Or a future coronavirus, All right? All of the above, exactly. Because the future, you could prevent a pandemic now. Right. By treating the initial outbreak in Wuhan with this, it reduces viral loads, probably pre reduces transmission. Yeah, it can make a big difference. And yeah. now it took a pandemic to get these drugs, this and Molnupiravir, presumably the others, but... right. That's good that we have them, right? Yes. I, I just remember way in the past, um, some people I know who are not scientists told me they always wished I would go ahead and cure the common cold because they were tired of it. <laughs> and I sort of always thought, oh, that's never something someone could do. you know. But this could be a drug to treat the common this cold. Could be. Yeah, at least the ones caused by coronas, yeah. Right. All right, then they looked in animals. They have a mouse model, which we've talked about. It's a mouse-adapted SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the Barrick Lab published that. Um, intranasal infection. The mice lose weight, but they don't die. They don't get terribly sick. So, But they can still look at uh, inhibition of weight loss. They can look at inhibition of virus in the lungs. Uh, and they do all of that, and it works. So the, the protocol is, uh, following infection, they treat mice twice a day at two different doses. 300 milligrams per kilogram and 1,000. They're protected from weight loss. They then look at lung titers. Uh, there is a couple log reduction, especially with the higher dose, uh, more, more reduction in lung titers. Um, the other thing that they, uh, I'm going to skip and come back to these. They then look in the lungs. There is some pathology caused by virus infection, although it's not enough to harm the mice apparently. Uh, and that, they can look at by sectioning lungs and comparing drug treated versus untreated. And you can see that there's an inhibition of the, the infiltration, you know, the, the tissue damage in the lung in the treated group. Uh, and then they say um, they measure the drug concentration in the serum of these mice. And it's well above the concentration you need to inhibit virus replication in cell culture. And so I asked Doris, I said, this is a virus in the lung. What does it mean if it's high in the blood? She said, ah, what you do is you correlate serum levels with efficacy after lung infection. And you do it in your various mouse and other animal models. And then you go in people and you say, we can reach this concentration in the serum and we know in the other animals that that correlates with protection of the lung. That's how you do that. That's why, because I couldn't imagine why, why it did serum matter, but it's a correlation, yeah. right? Yeah, so it's instead of a correlative protection, it's sort of correlative effect. Exactly. It's the concentration of drugs. So they get very high levels in the blood, in the serum of mice, and, that, and these mice are protected. So that immediately establishes the level that, that's consistent with that. Uh, they also... So then you just, you can't just do mice. You have to do other animals. They do rats and monkeys. They do oral administration. 
They look at the half-life of the drug in serum. They look at the uh, concentration of the serum. They calculate what's called oral availability F. So after you feed it to them, how much gets in the serum. Um, and interestingly, when they gave it to monkeys, they got poor levels in serum. And they think that's because, so there's an enzyme in all of us called cytochrome P450, which inactivates many drugs. It metabolizes them. And they think in the gut of monkeys, this enzyme is inactivating uh, the drug. You can inhibit cytochrome <laughs> P450 with a drug that was originally tried as a HIV protease inhibitor, ritonavir, turns out to be a great inhibitor of cytochrome P450. It's given with a number of other drugs to improve their uh, bioavailability. Isn't that cool? <laughs> it is so cool. And again, I just really do enjoy the way that they walk through kind of all of these steps here. Yeah, so ritonavir is used as an enhancer of several marketed protease inhibitors, darunavir and lopinavir, that are subject to metabolic clearance by cytochrome P450. So there actually is a trial ongoing where they use this with and without uh, ritonavir to see the difference uh, in people. Uh, then they say favorable off-target selectivity in a broad panel of G-protein-coupled receptors, kinases, transporters, other enzymes. I asked Doris, she said, you send it to a company and they do all of this for you. <laughs> they take your drug and ask, does it inhibit any of these other cellular targets? Sure. Right? Um, then you have to do a two-week toxicity study. It's called regulatory toxicity. Two weeks, you have to dose uh, your animals big time. Uh, they do it in monkeys and rats. In the monkeys, they gave them 60 to 600 milligrams per kilogram daily. So, you know, you have a five kilogram monkey times 600, 30 grams a day for two weeks. Yeah. And then you do the same lower dosing in rats. This is to see mm -hmm. if you take a ton of this, is there any problem? And folks, this is what's done with every drug that's FDA approved. Yes. Um, they measure this. Oh, no, go, go ahead. They measure the serum concentration. And then they have what's called NOAEL. No observed adverse effect level. What is the level of the drug? The last level where you don't see any adverse effects. For this drug, they couldn't get adverse effects. The maximum dose didn't do anything. The 600 milligrams per kilogram per day in monkeys and the 1,000 milligrams, oh, even more in rats. Per kid. No, no, no ale. Doris called it no ale. Did they do a no ale? It, yeah, <laughs> This is really good. <laughs> yeah, no, and it's nice. And it goes back to that, you know, no human uh, protease, cysteine proteases with this specificity. So that might, you know, relate to that. I was going to say in this section, yeah. um, I also learned a new word um, because they mentioned that their drug ha was not mutagenic or clastogenic. Clastogenic, And yes. I did not know clastogenic. I had to look it up in reading this paper. What um, does and it mean? so it means breaking chromosomes right. instead of causing mutations. I, th I think they're very lucky that it has no side effects. I do too. I yeah, I do too. You could not. I think it's very hard to predict. You know, and and when you're making these modifications, you don't know what's going to happen. All right. So now all of this, uh, presumably, this has been done in the last year, year and a half, right? Ever since sure. January 2020, uh, this then went into a phase one in healthy adult participants. Uh, multiple doses, four adults per dose. Um, they got um, one ta 100 migs at, uh, so the, they um, gave them ritonavir and then they gave them the drug. Um, and then they looked in the, this is a safety study, they look at the concentrations in the blood, and they look at side effects. So they say, after how many doses did they get? I forgot how many days, maybe two oral doses after the return of yeah, year. Yeah, yep. 150 MIGs and 250 MIGs. Safe and well tolerated. 
Oh, the ritonavir boosts the plasma concentrations of the drug. As you would expect. And the, there it's considerably above the EC90 for SARS-CoV-2, which we figured out in cells and culture. So you want to be able to get above the concentration you need in cells to inhibit, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what's hard to do for, for ivermectin. <laughs> because, yeah. Uh, so um, they say this um, uh, twice daily dosing paradigm, maybe five days, twice a day. So, in fact, since this paper was published, now we have a press release from Pfizer. They have a preliminary uh, phase 2-3 study. The study is called EPIC HR, <laughs> <laughs> Evaluation of Protease Inhibition of COVID-19 in High-Risk Patients. So it's a randomized, double-blind study, non-hospitalized adult patients who are at risk for getting severe illness. 89% uh, reduction in hospitalization or death compared to placebo. Uh, and this is giving the drug within three days of symptom onset. So there's a people who had a positive PCR. Within three days, they got enrolled in this trial and, and took the drug. So here are the numbers. 0.8% um, of the patients who received the drug, which is now called Paxlovid. Yeah, Paxlovid's a little bit of a strange name, but I think I'm used to strange names for COVID-related drugs at this point. 0.8% who received the drug were hospitalized through day 28. That's three out of 389 hospitalized, no deaths. 7% of patients who received placebo uh, who were hospitalized or died, 27 of 385. So that's 89% prevention of, uh, which is good of hospitalization and death because the Merck drug, Molnupiravir, was only about 50% effective in their preliminary release. Right. So they're no longer enrolling in this because the FDA said, that's enough. We don't need any more. It's clearly has good efficacy. Just finish what you have here and uh, you can submit it. Right. No longer ethical to withhold it from some of these patients. The, the control. Yeah. You don't yeah. want to say we're not going to give it to the controls because we see it works already. Right. Yeah. Right. So this is a preliminary analysis of interim data. So this not done yet, but in any clinical trial, you build in points where you take a look at the data and you decide whether to proceed or not. And so they decided to proceed, not to proceed, and also to proceed with a press release. <laughs> yes, which, you know, the press release obviously doesn't give us everything. Um, and so it doesn't tell us about anything other than, um, you know, preventing hospitalization and death. Um, but that would probably be really hard to look at anything else, given that the patients had to be symptomatic to enroll, yeah. to enroll within the trial. So there you have it. We have two candidates for antiviral pills, basically. It's good. Yeah. I feel like, you know, we're talking about a whole lot of positive things between uh, good T-cell responses, good drug. Yeah, absolutely. So good stuff. All right. So let's take a couple of emails, uh, Brienne. Sounds good. Did you take that first one from Jeff? Sure. Jeff writes, the wonderful discussion of how scientists respect being wrong in TWIV 818 reminded me of a terrific, and I believe, true story. A few years ago, after one or another scientific scandal was revealed, I think most of these more like science working than like scandals, a reporter interviewed the editor-in-chief of Nature, or it might have been the former EIC. The interview took place in a rowboat in some London park, because of course it did. Anyway, the reporter asked the editor of the world's premier general scientific journal to estimate how many of the papers in Nature were likely to be wrong. Although it was a published interview, I imagine that the editor didn't miss a beat in replying, in paraphrase, that's easy, they all are. Of course, he continued to try to explain how all models are approximations and about the self-correcting nature of science and so on. But his immediate reaction was, to my ear, a terrific, succinct, and memorable way of thinking about the constant striving for the truth that is science. I've thought about making a t-shirt that says something like, don't ask me, I'm a scientist. I'm probably wrong, but at least I know it. Might be a little much for a t-shirt. Cheers, Jeff. I, I really like that a lot, Jeff. Um, I, this is one that I feel like I can't quite say to my students because I'm not sure they're at a level yet where they get it. But my PhD advisor, whenever we would say, well, there is something published that says 
X is true. And it's like, great, that means there's a 50% chance it's true. Um, I guess if, if it was not published, it's less than 50% chance, but... The problem is that some people will take this and say, ah, all yep. science is wrong, therefore exactly. I'm not getting vaccinated, I'm not taking this drug, you Right, know. exactly. Because that's not what it means, actually. Right. For example, the identification of reverse transcriptase is correct, right? Yes, exactly. But maybe some ancillary things are not yeah, correct. There, there yeah, there are some details that need to be tweaked a little. And then there are papers where it's all wrong, right? <laughs> Sometimes that happens. But then we've if it's important, if it matters, it gets sorted out. If it doesn't matter, nobody cares, it will never get fixed, but it doesn't matter. And it, we science is always self-correcting. Timothy writes, Hi, Twivers, what kind of illness can you catch from the ghosts of dead mice? Hauntavirus. Thanks for the podcast. Tim is from London, Canada. That's cute, right? That is cute. I think that one uh, seems like a Halloween uh, letter. Yeah, this is, this is from Halloween for sure, which is two weeks ago now, but that's how it goes here. And Close. Timothy has a quote at the bottom from Marilyn Monroe who said, sometimes good things fall apart so better things can fall together. That's cool. That is cool. I like that. Brianne. All right. Photios. Writes, hello, I have a question about intramuscular injections. The vaccines are specified for intramuscular injections, but many untrained people were administering these vaccines due to volume and staff shortages. The vaccinations were not properly administered into muscle. What is the effect if the drug is not administered into muscle? Will this affect the efficacy of the vaccination? Second question, if someone is working at a place that does not offer health insurance and that worker has no health insurance, is the Rn of Delta virus, so I think that's like R not or some other kind of R. Is is the R of Delta vi the variant high enough that it would be financially safer for that person to stay home and not risk getting sick with COVID and possibly losing any money they could have made and their savings to cover the medical bills? Thank you for all your great work. Sincerely, uh, Photios. Um, and I agree with the note that Kathy put in here that. Um, I think that a person should get the COVID vaccine, um, which is free and doesn't matter even if you don't have health insurance. And um, it so prevents say, you get from getting hospitalized and dying, right? Even yes. with Delta. <laughs> exactly. Even with Delta, it seems to protect you very well. So I think, in fact, the financially safest thing um, and health-wise safest thing is for that person to get their vaccine. Um, I think with the intramuscular injections, I think it sort of depends on where exactly it is getting um, uh, injected. Um, I have heard of situations where kind of a missed vaccine stick can influence uh, vaccine efficacy, but I think that it is relatively rare. So, I mean, you, I don't think you're going to put it in the bone because that would really hurt and you would know it, right? Yeah, I don't think you're going to put it in the bone. I think that the only question is whether you um, don't get deep enough into the muscle. Yeah. Um, say if there, if you are incorrect and sort of are going more just into skin or if there's, say, a lot of fat deposit there or something, that would be the only case where you're not going into muscle. Hmm. Yeah, you could imagine that. Maybe they put it too shallow, yeah. Yeah. Then it would be, you wouldn't get as good an immune response, perhaps? Yes, I think you would have a slightly reduced immune response. I don't think it would be zero. Of course, you wouldn't know this, and so... Right. <laughs> it would just be buried in, in, in the poor responders, and you wouldn't mm -hmm. know why, right? Right. Mm. Uh, Brenda writes, uh, Brenda gives us a link to an article... In Al Arabia News, Russia confirms cases of new, more contagious variants. <laughs> Even more contagious than the Delta. AY.4.2. It's possible that the variant will spread widely. <sighs> All right, what does Brenda say? Russia has reported some COVID 19 infections with the new coronavirus believed to be even more contagious. It's possible that the variant will spread widely. Yeah. It's possible, but it's also possible that it won't. And, and in either case, it's just more fit and it may displace it and just get vaccinated because the vaccine will work against it. Exactly. Right. All of that is exactly right. Okay. Take the next one, please. All right. Brenda writes, 
Um, several Ethelreds reigned. Note the different kingdoms. Uh, so this is based on a, a discussion in the past where we mentioned Ethelred the Unready. Um, so one uh, is Alfred the Great. Uh, Alfred the Great from 848 or 49 to the 26th of October 899 was the king of the West Saxons from 871 until 886 um, and king of the Anglo-Saxons from 886 to 899. He was the youngest son of King Ethelwolf, who died when Alfred was young. Three of Alfred's brothers, Ethelbald, Ethelbert, and Ethelred, reigned in turn before him. Under Alfred's rule, considerable administrative and military reforms were introduced, prompting lasting change in England. Not Alfred's brother who preceded him, but around a century later, there was Ethelred the Unready. Um, then we have some details of old English pronunciation, and I don't know how to read. <laughs> we need Kathy here for that. Um, he was around from 966 until the 23rd of April, 1016. Um, known as the Unready, was king of the English from 978 to 1013, and again from 1014 until his death in 1016. His epithet does not derive from the modern word unready, mm. but rather from the old English unread, meaning poorly advised. It is a pun on his name, which means well advised. So I guess he's, his name means well advised. And then we say well advised, the poorly advised. Yeah, I guess. Right. Yeah, I guess. Um, William the Conqueror, William the First, um, from about 1028 until September 9th, 1087, uh, usually known as William the Conqueror and sometimes William the Bastard, was the first Norman monarch of England reigning from 1066 until his death in 1087. I learned about this one. He was a descendant of Rollo and was Duke of Normandy from 1035 onward. By 1060, following a long struggle to establish his throne, his hold on Normandy was secure. In 1066, following the death of Edward the Confessor, William invaded England, leading an army of Normans to victory over the Anglo-Saxon forces of Harold Godwinson at the Battle of Hastings and suppressed subsequent English revolts in what has become known as the Norman Conquest. The rest of his life was marked by struggles to consolidate his hold over England and his continental lands and difficulties with his eldest son, Robert Curtoz. <laughs> Have fun, Brenda from Black Isle, Scotland. And Brenda, I, again, uh, apologize for all of my poor pronunciation. All right. So we thought Ethel read the unready was different from what it really means. That's the bottom I, line. Yes, there, exactly. Right? Yes, this history is fascinating. It is. Almost as much as virology, Brenda. <laughs> <laughs> all right. One more. Um, from Neil, I'm including an article from a toxicology report which calls into question whether children should be vaccinated for COVID-19. What caught my attention were the author's list of a huge list of putative toxicities and harms from the vaccines. I'm not in a position to determine whether this list is plausible or not, but it sure would seem to be fodder for anti-vaxxers. I'm hoping you would present this article for discussion from your esteemed group of experts. I'm also sending it to Dr. Dan. Um, let's see. So the link is to an article in, in uh, Toxicology Reports, which is a journal. And it says, why are we vaccinating children against COVID-19? Uh, and I think it's an opinion because. <laughs> I think it's an opinion as well. Um, and you can publish opinions in, in journals for sure. There are not a host of toxicities and harms from the vaccines. There's on the contrary, they save lives. I just don't understand this. And Kathy looked into this a little more. She said, according to Retraction Watch, someone has called out this report's article uh, on Twitter and then on a blog post. Uh, so let's see who, this is the blog post here. Um, Elsevier fakes peer review of COVID clickbait. Earlier this month, Elsevier's toxicology reports published a special issue. It includes a remarkable article claiming that getting a COVID vaccine is extremely conservatively five times as likely to kill people over 65 as it is to save them. This echoes the fraudulent claims of a homeopath who briefly published a similar article in vaccines in June before it was retracted. Uh, so these are all nonsense for sure. Um, and I don't even think it merits us uh, discussion, frankly, because we know that vaccines do not kill you. Uh, Kathy says, I don't see how they can claim five times more deaths from the vaccine. Well, 
the fact is that when you die, if you're vaccinated, then you happen to die a week or two later. It's not the vaccine. Maybe it was your time. Right. And so this goes up with age. as the sh- <laughs> Yeah. So older uh, individuals more likely are, are, unfortunately, are more likely to pass away. And one of my favorite examples of this is with the um, 5 to 11-year-old data that went to the FDA mm-hmm. about adverse events. Um, so if you look at their data, there were five adverse events in Pfizer's trial. And so uh, based on the way that this is done, you would say that those were five vaccine-caused adverse events. Right. Um, be, and one of them was that the child swallowed a penny. Um, so apparently, according, if, if you were to use the same Caused type of analysis, yeah, yeah, um, sure. you would say that that vaccine causes you to swallow pennies, um, which seems a little unlikely. So that's the problem with VAERS, the Vaccine yes. Adverse Events Reporting System here in the U.S., that whenever something happens to someone who's been vaccinated, it's reported, but it may not have anything to do with the vaccine. And so what they do here is harvest those data and make it scary. And it's just so disingenuous, mm-hmm. right? Kids should be vaccinated. Kids can die yes, of COVID. They and can. If it's your kid, you don't want them to die, do you? I mean, so many people say, oh, the frequency is so low, we shouldn't worry about it. Well, if it was your kid who I died. I know. What, I can't even imagine what it would be like when, when you knew that there was something you could have done. Oh, no. I mean, Daniel has had very sick patients who say, I wish I had been vaccinated. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was wrong. So as a parent, you're responsible for the health of your kids because they don't make decisions until they're 18, right? You should get them vaccinated. Vaccines are, are fine. So if you're worried about myocarditis, it's treatable, it's reversible, it's brief, and it's way less frequent than caused by COVID. All right, let's do some picks, Brianne. So, <laughs> speaking of uh, vaccines, this is a video, um, and it was sent to me by a number of people. It seems to be made by someone called the Vaccine Makers Project. Um, And it is this absolutely gorgeous animation showing uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus infecting cells and then showing how antibodies are able to neutralize uh, and then going on to show mRNA in a lipid nanoparticle Mm -hmm. um, going into cells, being translated, um, being presented on MHC to uh, T cells that can help B cells and to T cells that are killer T cells. And it basically goes through all the steps of exactly how um, both the antibodies neutralize and then how you get um, immune responses following that mRNA vaccine. And it's this beautifully uh, illustrated two minute long video that shows all of these steps. I was so impressed with it. The the, the animation is gorgeous. Look at, don't you love the dendritic cell? Yeah, I love all of it. Uh, they even have a uh, a needle here. <laughs> right, no, they've got the needle. They've got, you know, MHC presenting to T yeah. cells well. They have every, you know, they have the ribosome translating the mRNA. They kind of have all of it done it's so beautiful. nicely. I was so impressed by this. The problem. antibodies sticking to the virus look like flies, right? Mm-hmm. And then a macrophage grabs it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think that it also is, you know, nice. approximately to scale with that antibody doing the neutralization which very huh. few images are ever really to scale on that. So this is from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Yeah. Chop, part of UPenn, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, they, they get a lot of uh, praise from me now, for this. Folks, why does this only have 71,000 views? Come on. And why does crap get millions of views? That's true. Well, I only heard about it today, so maybe it's relatively new. So what's the date? Oh, no, July 29th, 2021. This has been there for a while, so let's give it a twiv bump. Wisely, the uh, people who made it and uploaded it have turned off comments because they would get a bunch of garbage here. They um, would. But I hope that it gets a twiv bump and any other kind of bump it can get because it is fantastic. Uh, There's another one, another video called How mRNA Vaccines Work. Um, which has got over a million views, and it's not—it's just hand-drawn type of stuff, you know, mm-hmm. not not nicely rendered graphics. So this one's much nicer. Yeah, that's beautiful. It's really nice. Yeah, I nice. nice. I can't say enough about it. 
Okay, time for seminal papers in molecular biology number seven. It's the second immunology paper. Last time uh, it was uh, how antibody. you weren't on, but I did the Tonegawa paper. Brienne, Perfect. <laughs> which was so cool because it's like one experiment. It is, it is. And, and the gel, the gel was huge. It was two mm -hmm. kilograms of agaros or something. Yes, yes. Oh, it, man. I don't, I, I have not uh, made it through listening to that episode yet. So I don't know if you talked about this, but there's a, an article in in J Journal of Immunology called a Pillars of Immunology article mm -hmm. that talks about the backstory on that paper. Um, and it talks about all of those details and how they dealt with the gel and things like that. And I found it so useful learning about that. So this week it is uh, a nature paper by Rolf Zinkernagel and Peter Doherty, who apparently couldn't stand each other. <laughs> um, Zinkernagel in Switzerland, Doherty in, in Australia at the at now, but he was previously in uh, Tennessee. Restriction of in vitro T cell mediated cytotoxicity in lymphocytic choriomeningitis within a syngeneic or semi allogeneic system. And the abstract is is just a couple of sentences. Recent experiments indicate that cooperation between T cells and antibody forming cell precursors, B cells, is restricted by the H2 gene complex, MHC. Helper activity in vivo operates only when T cells and B cells share at least one set of H2 antigenic specificities. Evidence is presented here that the interaction of cytotoxic T cells with other cells budding LCMV is similarly restricted. In other words, for a T cell, a cytotoxic T cell to recognize a virus infected cell, it has to be H2 MHC compatible. Um, and this was huge. This, uh, it's another very simple paper with just a few uh, experiments. And um, that was published in 1974 when uh, I think that's the year uh, did I, I graduated from college in 1974. And then in 1996, it received, Do Doherty and Zinkernagel received the Nobel Prize for this, for their discoveries concerning the specificity of the cell-mediated immune defense. And it's a very nice description. Let me um, describe a few parts of it. Um, in the early 70s, when Doherty and Zinkernagel had begun their scientific work, it was possible to distinguish between antibody-mediated and cell-mediated immunity. <laughs> Isn't that funny? It, it's still possible to do that. <laughs> it was known that antibodies are produced by B cells. Uh, far less was known about how T cells work. Um, one area where cellular immunity had been studied was in transplantation, and it was known that T cells could kill cells from a foreign individual because they have different histocompatibility antigens. So Zinkernagel and Doherty used mice to show how T cells can protect animals uh, from a virus infection. Infected cells develop killer T cells, which you could take out and then they could kill virus infected cells in culture. But there was an unexpected discovery that T cells, even though they were reactive against that very virus were not able to kill virus infected cells from another strain of mice. What decided it was the MHC type. So self, it will only kill self infected cells, not from another mouse. And uh, that had a huge impact on immunology as a field, of course. And I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think of this paper as one of the really seminal papers of immunology and sort of immune responses to viruses. This is, you know, one of those papers that I think about a lot. Um, and so this is, you know, where we get the idea of T cells being restricted to your particular type of MHC. It all goes back to Zinkernagel and Doherty and their chromium release assays um, that they did to measure uh, T cell cytotoxicity. There had been some previous work with this. Right. There was a previous Nobel Prize on some details of MHC with uh, uh, Baruch Benasarov and some others uh, in 1980. Um, but this is the one that kind of tied this to viral infection and not just um, transplantation. So that's a good point, just chromium release. So they used to take the infected cells and add chromium and it would they would take it up mm -hmm. and then you would wash away the the... The, the un, unabsorbed chromium, and then you would take those cells and add your T cells. And when the cells got lysed, 
the chromium would be released into the medium, which you could then count in a, in a scintillation counter, right? Yes, exactly. That's exactly how it worked. And now nobody does it that way. So how do they do it now, uh, Brianne? Uh, so I have actually done both ways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I've done uh, a chromium release assay. Usually um, you, what you can do is either uh, load some dye into the cells right. um, and look for a loss of dye in the cells. You can look at the release of intracellular enzymes. So you can look at lactate dehydrogenase in the cell and its release. Um, or the other way is actually really a dye way as well. Um, so you're, you're looking for loss of those cells um, that are, have been dyed. Yeah, we, we tend to stay away from radioactivity nowadays. Yes. Yeah. So the whole point of this is not really that you don't want to kill someone else's virus infected cells, but that everyone's MHC is different, right? Yeah, and that also gets at why, you know, it starts to have us think about why it's important that all of our MHCs are different. That means that someone is going to be able to present an ideal epitope from a virus, no matter which new virus comes in our population, since we all have different MHCs, someone is going to be able to make the ideal T-cell response. Yeah, and this is in part why island populations with less polymorphic MHC genes are more susceptible to infections, right? Yes, also cheetahs. <laughs> <laughs> cheetahs too? Also, the, people talk about cheetahs being very endangered and a lot of risk to cheetahs, and it's because they went through a genetic bottleneck and all have basically mm -hmm. the same MHC. It's also why Tasmanian doubles have a facial exactly. tumor. Exactly, facial tumor, yeah, because they have a very restricted MHC. Yeah, very cool stuff. All right, we have a couple of listener picks. Lisa writes, hello, great sages of TWIV. I thought you and your listeners might be interested in Shall Furnish Medicine. The three-part miniseries from the podcast, The Modern West, this miniseries focuses on the impact infectious diseases have had on indigenous Americans since the arrival of Europeans with a focus on how the U.S. federal government responded or didn't in the activities of Native American communities. Society changing epidemics are in the recent past of Native Americans and tribal governments generally reacted aggressively to the COVID-19 pandemic, but political and economic factors still contributed to a situation in which many communities were devastated. And she provides a link to the trailer and notes, uh, American Indian and Alaska Natives have the highest rates of infections, hospitalizations, and deaths of any racial group or ethnicity in the U.S. and provides a CDC link for that. Thank you again for your wonderful service and keeping us informed. Lisa is in Eugene, Oregon, where rain for the next four months. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Lisa. This sounds really cool. I really want to uh, take a look at it. Can you take the next uh, pick? Sure. Uh, Bistra writes, hello. The recent smallpox episode reminded me about a book I read last year in the midst of the COVID pandemic, Saving the World by Julia Alvarez. It's a fictionalized story around a real event, the Balmese expedition to inoculate against smallpox the Spanish colonies in the America and the Philippines in 1803, and a parallel story about the AIDS epidemic in the Dominican Republic. It's hard to imagine the personal sacrifice several people made to participate in the expedition and the distrust their efforts were met with in many of the colonies they visited, along with the community distrust in the HIV AIDS story reminded me a lot about the times we live through today. A great book about a fascinating story. I highly recommend it. Fiction has a place in teaching about history as well. Uh, thank you. And Bistra is from Minneapolis. Kind of connected with the other one, right? It is, yeah. yes. Same idea. Very cool. All things I'm interested in reading about. Okay. TWIV 829. Microbe.tv slash TWIV is where you can find the show notes. If you want to send us a question or a comment, send it to TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you enjoy what we do, consider supporting us, in particular throughout November, December, and January. All donations made to Parasites Without Borders will be matched and given to Microbe TV. So that's the best way to support us for the next three months. Go to ParasitesWithoutBorders.com, click on the Donate button. Your donations are tax deductible because Parasites Without Borders uh, is a 501c3, which here in the U.S. means you're tax exempt and anything you give to it is tax deductible. And by the way, Parasites Without Borders was founded by Daniel Griffin. So it's all in the family. You can give it <laughs> to them. And why are we doing this? 
Well, as Daniel is very nice. And because Microbe TV doesn't yet have its 501c3 designation, which is in the works and the IRS is backlogged and so forth. So until then, we're getting supported by uh, Parasites Without Borders. Parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Daniel. Brian Barker is at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thank you, Brian. Nice to be with you today. Thanks. It was great to be with you, too. It was fun to talk about some immunology and some not immunology. <laughs> you bet. Always good. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIB and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.